Internationalism, National Identities and Study Abroad, France and the United States, 1890 to 1970, which came out in 2010. Her paper today is called Elite Women's Stakes in Regime Changes During the Revolution and Napoleonic Eras. In response to the publication of Madame de Staël's Consideration sur la Révolution Française in 1818, Claire de Rémoussat, former lady of the palace to Josephine Bonaparte, rushed to her desk, threw aside the novel she was working on, and started writing her memoirs, unleashing a torrent of emotion and memories. And she wrote, I was consumed with the need to speak of Bonaparte. I found myself telling of the death of the Duke of Dunguien that terrible week that I spent at Malmaison. In a letter to her son, the author and liberal monarchist Charles de Rémusat, she elaborated on her feelings and her writing. And now I'm quoting her. As I am an emotional person, at the end of a few lines, it seemed that I was back in those times. The facts and the words came back to me as if on their own. Now, Remusa experienced complicated emotions regarding her service during the consulate and empire. This paper examines expressions of emotion in selected elite women's accounts of their lives during the revolutionary and Napoleonic eras, and particularly in relation to the regime changes they experienced. Personal narratives by elite women with close or loose ties to Napoleon both reinforce and complicate existing scholarship on the history of emotions and of regime changes in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And now I'm going to go through the litany of the same scholars that you've just heard about. In The Navigation of Feeling, William Reddy makes a compelling case for two main phases in the history of emotions in modern France. A pre-revolutionary regime of sentiment that developed outside of the emotional control exerted by the royal court and ended with Robespierre's downfall in 1794 and the subsequent liberal and romantic sensibility that prevailed from 1815 to 1848. Reddy presents the Napoleonic era as implementing a shift from virtue to honor and as reinstituting old regime control over emotional expression in, in public. In Reddy's work and in other scholarship, for example, Marisa Linton on Emotion in the Reign of Terror, or Pierre Cerna's La République des Girouettes and Emmanuel uh, de Basquiel's Sans Jour, uh, both of these latter are on responses to regime changes. We learn a lot about men's adaptation to political changes and their practices of emotional expression, though less about women's responses to events that affected their lives and self-expression as well, with the notable exception of Madame Roland and Madame de Stal. In her study of ordinary, uh, an ordinary middle-class woman's correspondence during the French Revolution, Lindsay A. H. Parker invokes Reddy's conception of emotives to understand Rosalie Julien's personal feelings and the influence of a revolutionary government on constraining their expression. Departing from the history of emotions as a methodology and successfully analyzing emotions as a subject, Jennifer Hoyer analyzes the shift in representations of women's emotions from urging their men into patriotic war under Napoleon to post-war mothers' tearful gratitude to Louis XVIII for ending war and conscription as a means of legitimizing the restoration. Though not explicitly framed within the history of emotions, scholarship by Denise Davidson clearly demonstrates ordinary women's stakes in regime changes during the Napoleonic era and their capacity to adapt, survive, and even flourish despite conditions of insecurity and instability. I aim to develop further the interactions of political regimes and women's emotional expression, but first it is necessary to account at least a little for memory, history, and self-fashioning in elite women's writings and for their age and generational positioning during the revolution and under Napoleon. 
Um, I limit my consideration here to the work of Damien Zanon, who identifies some 450 memoirs published between 1815 and 1848 that addressed recent history and particularly the history of Napoleon. He analyzes them as a distinctive genre, with the authors explicitly engaging with memoirs by others, self-consciously intending their works to be history rather than autobiography for the most part and fostered by the publishing industry and a narrative urge, that's his expression, following 25 years of revolution and empire. Zanon addresses works by women and men, but only those published during the period of parliamentary monarchy, since his conception of memoirs as a genre is rooted in that historical moment. In this paper, I focus primarily on two texts that were published late in the 19th century, but were written much earlier, which may explain the richness of their emotional expressions since the authors did not anticipate publication during their lifetimes. Occasionally, I will also interject passages from other and different forms of personal narratives, letters and autobiographies, as well as memoirs, in order to investigate emotional responses to political change and to Napoleon. I generally follow Reddy's approach to emotional claims as description, relation, and self-exploration, and link them to political, cultural, and gender history. And at the end, I will raise some questions about emotional regimes and emotional communities, and I have to say, I'm, I'm, uh, this paper raised a lot more questions for me than it answered. The figures examined here offer different motivations or justifications for writing that suggest different emotional registers. As we saw, driven by her reading of de Stael and encouraged by her son, Claire de Remusat felt sorrowful when, con when conjuring her youthful innocence at the time she first met Napoleon. And she writes, my imagination withers when it returns to these memories. I feel something painful in my past illusions and my current sentiments. While she claims that she wrote for no one, she expressed concern that if her son eventually decided to publish her memoirs, people might think she was, quote, bad, or at least malicious. But, quote, the cry of truth kept her going, unquote. She felt a compulsion to explain herself and her submission to Napoleon's influence. Laura Junot, la Duchesse d'Abrantes, the wife of one of Napoleon's generals and a childhood friend of Napoleon, claimed that she had long resisted friends' prodding, that she should refute errors about her husband and herself, propagated in memoirs published by others, because it would arouse emotions. And she wrote in the introduction to her own uh, memoir, Refutation is never calm. It is almost always impassioned, and so becomes ridiculous in the mouth of a woman. But later in life, when she was no longer a high society figure and she needed the money, she overcame these reservations. And so she writes that she put in order a crowd of memories that were very painful to recall. And she also disavowed any vengeful intentions. Victorine de Chastenay, from a liberal noble family, was welcome in the highest social circles through successive regimes and started writing her memoirs as early as 1791 when she was 20. Most of the writing occurred between 1810 and 1817 and she communicated the wish that the memoirs be published after her death in 1855. Her short preface states that she felt, quote, the need to say with simplicity what she saw or what she believed she saw, unquote, and that the intention of her memoirs was, quote, to find the history of the human heart in that of the revolution, unquote. Finally, the letters of Marianne de Gerando, born in Alsace to a noble family, were not apparently for publication, though the editor notes that in her lifetime, Madame de Stael deemed Gerando one of the best letter writers she knew. Gerondo cared for her ailing father who was ruined by the revolution, married the linguist and ethnographer Joseph-Marie de Gerondo in 1798, and accompanied him to some of his posts in the Napoleonic administration. Her son Gustave published the letters and some diary excerpts late in the 19th century with the intention of instructing young women and mothers. And my reading of them is that they reveal an introspective individual who valued emotions as a human quality. 
The four women were close in age. Ray Moussa and Abrantes were children during the French Revolution, while Chastenay and Gerondeau grew up under the old regime. The two younger women were also much more closely tied to Napoleon than were Chastenay and Gerondeau, and while Abrantes defended Napoleon, Ray Moussa endeavored to distance herself from him. Emotions appeared in different guises in their writings, and I will focus on them in connection with family relations, personal identity and adherence to virtue, and observations on the public and political uses of emotions. Ray Moussa struggled to reconcile the admiration she and many others felt toward Napoleon during the early years of the consulate with the distaste and even horror over Napoleon's subsequent actions that were her dominant emotions when she wrote her memoirs in 1818 and 1819. Her family had been ruined during the revolution, her father was executed in 1794, and her husband needed a job in 1802 when, thanks to the regard that Josephine felt for Claire's mother as coming from a distinguished noble family. Her husband was appointed prefect of the palace and she became part of Josephine's entourage. At that time, Napoleon enjoyed popular support and the Ray Moussa's regard. And she wrote, when Napoleon became part of the consulate, everyone breathed. Initially, he inspired confidence. Gradually, troubling things occurred, but we were employed. The back and forth continued between justifying the couple's service to Napoleon and acknowledging Napoleon's shameful acts. Napoleon betrayed those who'd believed in him, but she asserted there was nothing humiliating in the Ray Moussa's story. And she's, oh, you can just feel the agony as she's countering these, these contradictory feelings. For Ray Moussa, the murder of Donguien, despotic practices as emperor, and the deaths of so many soldiers in the endless wars were the actions of Napoleon she most deplored. She never hinted that she or her husband contemplated leaving Napoleon's employ, though she increasingly identified her allegiance with the Beauharnais rather than to the Bonapartes. Chastenay recounted the history of the revolution through her parents and her own emotions. Although her father supported reform in 1789, her mother feared political change and its potential harmful effects on establishing her children in life. Initially, Chastenay and her father, at least as she presents it, were enthusiastic and optimistic about the Estates General and prospects for reform. But the Women's March on Versailles in October, quote, struck her mother and father to the heart. After witnessing more events in Paris in 1791 and 1792, her mother, quote, languishing and succumbing to so much sadness, finally departed Paris. She could not bear any more. Then, during the terror, the family spent six months in Rouen, and Chastenay recalled that time as one of suffering and of supportive community, just what Victoria was talking about. And she wrote, never was unity more perfect than ours. Uh, misfortune and danger had strengthened our bonds, uh, meaning her family and friends. Uh, conditions were worse when the Chastenays returned to their Burgundy properties in 1794 and fear was constant. And she wrote, aside from a few too rare moments, the heart was always tight and the smallest unexpected event caused the most heartrending anxieties in the imagination. Nonetheless, one had adopted the habit of never complaining, even almost to oneself. The walls could hear and betray. Moreover, we had to have our wits about us at all times. With the law of 22 Prairial, Chastenay saw her beloved father as a victim and she began the process of radiation, of striking his name off the list of the accused. While the terror inspired emotions of fear and concern for family members, Chastenay also found a vocation in radiation. She first learned the procedures and made important contacts in her efforts to strike her father's name off the list. Her words imply some pride when she asserted that in her family, all interests rested in me. After endless appeals, setbacks, and an important relationship, perhaps a romance, with Pierre-François Réal, a former attorney at the Châtelet, prosecutor of a revolutionary tribunal, and eventually a supporter of Bonaparte, Chastenay experienced the joy of her father's release after Nine Thermidor and his return to the family. And she wrote, happy moments. Why are such sweet memories so often distant from our minds? How they would make us better. 
Okay, then working to strike off the name of her brother-in-law um, in the form of, I'm sorry, I think it was her sister-in-law, from the list of emigres took more time, and Chastanet continued to help friends and relatives get their names struck off the list of emigres through the directory and in the, into the early consulate. She was so successful on many occasions that she quoted Paul Barras saying to her, if anyone ever files a suit against me, I want you for my defense. I mean, that it's really her pride in, in what she was able to accomplish is, is, I think, quite evident. Helping family members was a source of pride and consolation for Remusa and Chastenay. And they also expressed pride that Napoleon recognized them as women of intelligence, especially perhaps because, according to Remusa, no Napoleon, quote, disdained women. Unquote. Remusso blamed her susceptibility to Napoleon's esteem um, for her in part on her youth, and she claimed that the negative reactions to the time she spent alone with Napoleon caused her to dislike the court life to which she was committed. And as an example, she wrote, in 1803 she visited the camp of Boulogne because her husband was sick and she wanted to care for him. Napoleon approved of her devotion to her husband and he also invited her to have lunch and dinner with him, claiming that a lone young woman in a military camp needed protection. Remusa enjoyed their conversations about literature and she felt increased regard for the first consul. And she wrote, he welcomed me so nicely. He showed much interest in my care for my husband. Well, after all the attentions that soothed my worried and oppressed soul and the amusement that he provided in my solitude and the petty satisfaction of my flattered vanity that he seemed to enjoy the pleasure of my presence, all this exalted by feelings. And as soon as I returned, I told this story with intense gratitude of my 20 years that his goodness to me had been extreme. So then she, she, she goes on to say that she was unprepared for the different negative responses to this account. Remusa felt devastated that soldiers thought she and Napoleon were having an affair, Josephine was jealous of her, and basically the people had a low opinion of her that she felt she did not deserve. Chastenay also enjoyed Napoleon's attention and regard. She met him in 1795 when a neighbor, who was a young officer, brought him as a guest to Châtillon, where her family lived. Noted for being taciturn and suspect for many of Chastenay's friends because of his republican exterior, Napoleon presented a challenge to local aristocratic society. Chastenay approached the silent visitor with a question about Corsica, and she claims that their subsequent conversation lasted for four hours. Sixteen years later, when Chastenay was presented at the imperial court, Napoleon remembered her and they both inspired each other's memories of their long conversation. And she wrote, I was flattered and very touched also, I must say. In addition to writing about emotions associated with helping their families and with personal identity, Remusa and Chastenay also observed emotions in political men, including Napoleon's use of anger for political purposes, his tears, and the tears of other men. Remusa noted the ways that Napoleon manipulated emotion for political ends, for example, when he expressed rage at the English ambassador on the eve of the resumption of war. Remusa describes how, just before the monthly reception of all ambassadors and their wives that Josephine hosted, the first consul was happily playing with his nephew and advising his wife and Remusa on their clothes, apparently in the best of humors. When he entered the reception, his face changed suddenly. He strode to the English ambassador and began to complain bitterly about the English government. His anger seemed to increase each moment. It soon reached a point that terrified the entire assembly. The hardest words, the most violent threats clattered through his trembling lips. The ambassador could barely reply. And Remusa included this incident to illustrate, quote, how Napoleon could pass from great calm to great anger when he thought it useful. Um, okay, I'm going to move on. Chastenay recorded a different case of emotional expression by two men who served Napoleon in one of her many quests for radiation. She describes in detail the emotions associated with proceedings to strike off the name of Monsieur de Merle d'Ambert, a former Marine commander who had somehow been brought before a military commission. 
General Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, who had served under Dampere in his youth, joined Réal, her friend, to defend the man, and both did all they could, but the judgment was against him. Bernadotte then appeared in tears before the directory to spare his life, and Réal left the military commission in tears because they were unable to reverse the death sentence. At the same time that she witnessed Bernadotte and Réal in tears over Dambert, a case in which she was also involved, Chastenay also succeeded in striking off the name of her sister-in-law and celebrated that event at a dinner hosted by Barras. She noted the emotional roller coaster of feeling sorrow followed closely by elation. I think nothing is worse than a succession of contrary emotions and scenes. Remusat's disillusionment with Napoleon over the execution of Dungian in 1804 caused her great emotional anguish that persisted through the end of his rule. She recounted the story of Dungian's capture, trial, and execution and said of that event, I experienced the greatest dread I ever felt in my life. She wanted to throw herself at Napoleon's feet and beg that Ungian's life be spared, but Josephine said it would be useless. I felt a sort of inner heartbreak personal to myself, she wrote, indicating that her love and admiration for Napoleon had been shattered. Remusa expressed her feelings of shame at being associated with this inhuman act. From this moment, I began to blush in my own eyes for the chain I carried. Remusa asserts that she more or less successfully suppressed this secret feeling throughout the rest of Napoleon's rule. Now moving on again with more emotions of, of regime change. Chastenay described the Bourbon restoration as an emotional liberation, not incidentally dissimilar from the way Remusa described the beginning of the consulate. As the foreign troops and rulers marched into France, she wrote, the exaltation produced by the movement of this day was an indication for us that the revolution was completed. For the first time in so many years, all hearts felt emotion. The springs of sentiment squeezed for so long suddenly relaxed. Sensitive to the humiliation of foreign invasion, Chastenay described dual emotions at that moment. One felt conquered, one felt liberated at the same time. The heart beat with a thousand emotions. Remusa also characterized the restoration as a liberation, though her memoirs ended in 1808 and she did not complete her account of Napoleon's divorce and his eventual downfall. She did, however, briefly indicate that in 1814, many were surprised at her heartfelt desire for Napoleon's downfall and the return of the monarchy, since the Remusas stood to lose much by the change. And she wrote, the return of the king ruined us, but it put our thoughts and sentiments at ease. It promised a future for our son to fulfill the noble aspirations of youth. And then she quoted her husband husband saying to their son, you will be poor, but not constrained and stifled, as his parents had been under Napoleon. Regime changes generated emotional responses in women in the ways that they affected their families and in their sense of themselves as worthy human beings. Though troubled by political changes that harmed her mother, father, and brother, Chastenay found satisfaction and pleasure in becoming adept at striking off names from the list of emigres. By contrast, Remusa felt bad about serving a leader who committed crimes that made her feel, quote, forced no longer to love he whom she must always serve. And these are her words. She could excuse herself to some extent by remembering her youthful hopes and naivete and the practical issues of employment and income for herself and her husband. She suggested that unlike women, men did not worry about the morality or values of the leaders they served. Served. And she wrote about a conversation she had with Talleyrand when he uh, recounted stories about Napoleon's hypocrisy and deceptions, his knavery, les fourberies. And then she writes, he was surprised to see that in listening to him, I shed tears. When Talleyrand asked her what was wrong, she replied, you really hurt me. You political men, you need not love whom you serve, but I, a poor woman, what would you have me do with the disgust that your stories inspire in me? And what will become of me when I can no longer maintain an illusion about Napoleon? 
Um, she also asserted that her husband dealt with Napoleon's shortcomings in the same pragmatic way as did Talleyrand. Remusa suggested that men, in contrast to women, were not emotional about politics and changed positions easily. Indeed, when Paul de Remusa, uh, her grandson, finally edited and published his grandmother's memoirs in 1881, he quoted his father, Charles de Remusa, who asserted that his father <laughs> supported the Bourbons out of political necessity, while Claire was more sentimental about their return. And then uh, he wrote, it was pure politics that led my family to support the restoration. My father acted like a man who did something out of necessity and who willingly accepted the consequences. My mother, a little more excited as a woman, a little more prone to Bourbon sentimentalism, let herself go with the movement of the time. We can talk about gender differences. I don't want to go too far with this, but I think it's worth quoting these observations. For these and other women, emotions that might have remained private became public with regime changes and their sense of the importance of their experiences of them. Sadness is a strong emotion in their accounts for lost youth, for mistakes made, and sometimes because regime changes could be extremely disruptive. As for Abrantes, who contended that the revolution deprived all women of her generation of a childhood. And Marie Dagou, writing much later, who claimed that Napoleon's return in 1815 ended her childhood. I told you I was going to throw in a few other ones. Their accounts suggest an emotional community of sufferers and survivors during a period of political instability, rather than an emotional regime in sync with political regimes. These and other texts also suggest a transitional generation of women born in the old regime and growing up with the old regime influences, often from their mothers, but also maturing during the revolution and under Napoleon and then writing in the context of the restoration or July monarchy. So, you know, what emotional regime do they really represent? Honor and virtue mattered to Remusa and Chastenay, but they understood them differently than did men, and they do not fit neatly into old regime, revolutionary, or post-revolutionary categories established by you know, scholars like Reddy. This examination of women's emotions suggests that both honor and virtue were linked to support for one's family as well to personal merit, and in the case of Remusa, loyalty to a political leader, but neither was exclusively public or private or strictly divided by gender. Works by Michael J. Hughes and Brian Martin chart the development of honor and friendship in the Napoleonic armies and beyond, and more attention to women and emotions during the Napoleonic era could constructively contribute to the social and cultural history of that time. Was there a distinctive emotional regime under Napoleon? Did the period from 1800 to 1815 represent a transition between two different emotional regimes? Would emotional communities or emotional generations be more helpful terms than emotional regimes? Having posed these questions, I will end with a commentary on emotions from another survivor of the revolution and Napoleon, Marianne de Gérandeau. I cannot say whether they reflect old regime sentimentality or restoration restoration, liberty, and sensibility, or perhaps a long experience of regime changes and emotional adjustments, adjustments to them. But her lines clearly assert the importance of emotions. Gérando articulated the merits and limitations of emotion in a letter of 1821 to her adult son. According to Gérando, feelings were to be shared with friends, for in the company of friends one could be oneself. By implication, feelings were limited to private, private rather than public venues, but were admirable in both women and men. She expressed displeasure in a letter that one of her son's friends had written, astonished at the lack of emotion in it. And she wrote, nothing unless is less sentimental than this letter. What will his heart say to him when he is 40 if he subjects it to such a dry regime now? And then when she finished the letter, she uh, wrote to her son that he probably already knew that whereas goodness is always appreciated, quote, sensibility is not always understood and it is never appropriate to express sentiment where it would not be understood. Unfortunately, it often appears ridiculous to those who do not know emotion. 
Nevertheless, she wrote that sensibility is a loving gift, valuable for the pleasures it secures, sometimes even for the sufferings that derive from it. But sensibility has a charm that cannot be feigned. One should feel sorry for those who are deprived of sensibility. Thank you.